Before we bring you this next demo, there is a caveat that I would like to share with you. When I started preparing to record this demo, I thought it would be one of the easier demos of the series. The reality was a little more complex than that. As I started looking at Junus's PIM dense mode implementation in greater detail, namely at the packet level, I started realizing that it was a little different from what I had encountered in the past. Most of my past experience with PIM dense mode is with Cisco. I had implemented it on Junus before, but never studied it at a packet level. I had also read a majority of the RFC, never cover to cover, but on an as needed basis as any confusions arose. I never saw any incongruity between Cisco's implementation and the RFC, so I took that as a standard. Looking at the packet captures from Juno's implementation, I immediately realized that they were a little different than Cisco's. First of all, there seemed to be more packets exchanged per transaction in a majority of cases. My first reaction was to start looking for implementation details available from Juniper. Unfortunately, no matter how hard I looked, I found no documentation or text that provided any details past a simple description of the protocol and how to configure and verify its operation. It is safe to say that I looked into most publicly available documentation and looked at every single text that covers multicast for Junos that at least I am aware of. My next move was to study each transaction separately and compare it with what I saw with Cisco and make some educated guesses and logical conclusions. Therefore, you should take this demo with a grain of salt as nothing I state in the demo can be backed up with any official documentation or text, at least when it comes to those extra packets that are not seen in the Cisco world. For the vast majority of the cases, my conclusion was that Junos has built more reliability into the protocol with the exchange of those extra packets. For example, it seems that upstream Junos devices always acknowledge a prune message sent to them, and how they do it is by multicasting an identical copy of that message back to the downstream devices. The logical conclusion I came to in this, in this case was that the upstream device was signaling the reception of the prune explicitly and the resulting actions that it would take back to the senders of the prune. In all the cases, the extra packets or actions seem like enhancements that would really not break the RFC, but if the receiver understood the meaning of those extra packets, it would simply make the implementation more reliable. So I don't think anybody has to worry about Cisco devices in a Junos implementation or Junos devices in a Cisco implementation. My research says that they should work with each other. This brings me to the end of this caveat. I sincerely hope that you enjoy watching this video as much as I enjoyed creating it. If you do come across something in the video that is verifiably wrong and you think that I came to the wrong conclusion about something, I would really appreciate if you could leave a comment saying so. Alternatively, I can be contacted via the decodingpackets.info website, but in the end, I would really like to hear from you, especially if the information that I'm disseminating here could possibly be wrong. We would want to fix that. Thank you very, very much for watching this video. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another demo in our IP multicast lecture series. The topic for today is PIM dense mode on Juno's routers. Now this comes on the heels of one lecture on PIM dense mode that I highly recommend you go over and it's essentially a prerequisite to successfully uh, to successfully going over this demo. There was also a demo done on iOS routers, so PIM dense mode on iOS routers, that you may want to pick and choose some parts of to watch. So both of these are available already in the lecture series. The third demo that I highly recommend going over if you're unfamiliar with our lecture series is demo zero, which is the dissemination of the topology information. So the topology in front of you, that is discussed in that particular demo. 
But one of the few points I'd like to cover here is the major network that may not be apparent here. So the major network is 172.26. So 172.26 slash 16 is the major network. So anytime you see something like 12.0, slash 24, that essentially means it's 172.26.12.0 slash 24, or any of the loopbacks are 172.26.0.x slash 32. But all of this information, once again, in demo zero. In this particular lecture, every single one of the devices from R1 to R7, every single one of these devices is a Juno's device. So it's a core that consists completely of Juno's routers only. These are VSRXs running on VMware. The source is an iOS router. That is, so it's an iOS router, but it is not doing any unicast routing protocols on it. It is not doing any multicast routing protocols on it. It is just a simple host that is going to send ICMP echoes on our multicast addresses that the receivers may join. And where are the receivers? They are down here on the bottom left hand, uh, bottom right hand corner. And these are REC 100 and REC 200. Once again, these are iOS routers, but they are working as receivers only. They're not running any multicast routing protocols. They are not running any unicast routing protocols. Uh, last but not the least, the Unicast routing protocol running in the topology is OSPF and it is running only in area zero. There are no other fancy areas or anything like that. It's just OSPF, it's just area zero. So having said that, let's go ahead and dive right into our topology here. And let's verify some basic connectivity of our devices. So from the source, which is up top right here, so the source, once again, is right here. So from source, we are going to try to ping both of the receivers, and these are just unicast pings at this point, so no multicast. And we are also going to trace to them to see what paths our topology might actually take. So let's go ahead and do that. So from the source, the very first thing I'm going to do is ping 172.26.56.100. And we can see we can reach that particular destination and also 200. So having done that, let's go ahead and trace to it. So trace 172.26.56.100. And as you can see, that path actually goes from R1 to R2 over to R3 to R4, 6, and then 100. So really the path that is being followed here in that particular trace, and it's really going to depend on load balancing, is this path. So from R1 to R2, R2 to R3, down to R4 to R6, and then finally coming over to 100. So there are two paths available, but right now the way the load balancing is working, it's going via R3. But another time it may actually go through R7, through this way, down there, and maybe something like that. So once again, we're just going to go on R7. I haven't been able to make anybody use R7 because of the load balancing yet, but let's go on R7 and verify some basic connectivity again because it's not showing up in our trace. So on R7, and let me just trace to 200 as well here, see if that is any different. But no, it takes the same exact path. So we'll just go on R7 and we'll check uh, OSPF neighbors first of all. So we'll say run show OSPF neighbor. And as you can see, it, ha it has a neighborship with R2 as well as R4. And if you don't have the topology already, there is a link in the description of this video and you can download this topology to follow along with it because I may not be able to keep it on the screen at all times, not with these many terminal windows open. So let's also look at some routes on R7. So we'll say run show route. And how about we look for everything with a slash 32. 
So there you go. If I see all of the loopbacks here, then I have connectivity. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and my own loopback. And I have some connected interfaces. So I should have loopback to loopback connectivity. The last thing I can do here is I can trace to 172.26.56.100 to make sure I have connectivity over. So as you can see, the packets go over to R4, down to R6, and finally to the destination. And how about 200? And the same way. So, and I just want to make sure if R5 is in this topology. So we'll just say run show interface ters on R5. And as you can see, interface 56 is up, it's running. So let's quickly ping some of these devices. We'll say ping or run ping 172.26.56.100. So I can get to it. And how about 200? So just to make sure I have LAN connectivity there. So I have LAN connectivity there. So everything in our topology seems to be working. Everybody is OSPF neighbors with everybody else. Right now, there is no PIM in this topology at all. So if I was to basically issue the show protocols command everywhere, I can see I have OSPFs so R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and prove the point I have OSPF everywhere. I don't have any PIM, I don't have any IGMP. So let's go ahead and bring that in. So we're going to bring PIM dense mode and start it on this topology. And I'll just basically put PIM on all of the devices pretty much all at once because I want PIM on every single one of the interfaces. And just like with most things in Junos, there is a separate hierarchy that has been made available for protocols PIM. So instead of activating PIM dense mode under all of the separate interfaces, like you would do in iOS, you would, you would actually activate all of the interfaces for a mode under the protocol. So let's take a look at what that configlet really looks like. So it would look something like this. Now this is under the PIM hierarchy, so this is protocol PIM. Forget about the trace options here for a second, but if you look at it, all of the interfaces, every single one, has been activated for dense mode PIM. That's all this configuration does. Now let's take a look at the trace options, which is essentially the debug for Junos. I'm collecting all of the trace op trace information in a file called 2pim. Now this would be under slash var slash log in your actual on your hard disk. Uh, what am I actually tracing here? So all of the normal events in detail, the assert events in detail, because we are going to have to look at them later on, the prunes and the joins, again in detail, the state change information for pim dense mode, any graphs that the network performs, and a lot of the tasks that are happening in the background. So I'll go ahead and I'll copy this for right now. I'll move this out of the way. And the way we are going to actually put it in, so I'll do it on one router. And we'll go into Edit Protocols BIM. And then we'll actually merge the copied uh, configuration here. So we'll say Load merge relative, relative because it's under a protocol, not at the top level of the hierarchy. And how are we pasting it? We're pasting it via the terminal. Now I can go ahead and just paste that configuration here and control D to signal the end of the line. So now if I say show compare, all of that information is there. So I'll have to repeat this on every single one of the routers. Don't forget to commit, it's Junos. So what I'll do is I'll go into edit protocols BIM. On, so it's going to give an error here, but it should be okay on all of the other routers. So all of the other routers are now in protocol PIM. And I'll also say, so one command to a command blast to every single one of them, load merge relative terminal. So every single one of them is in this mode right now. Now I can paste the configuration that I had. So I can paste it, control D, and I can commit all of them together. So I can paste it, control D, always on a new line by itself. That's very important. Control D, control D, 
R6, Control D, and finally R7, Control D. Now I'm just going to commit everything everywhere in a single command from here. So now everything should be committed and every interface should be now activated for BIM. Now, when it comes to R5 and R6, so this bottom half of our topology when it comes to R5 and R6, essentially when you start PIM on interface 56, so VLAN 56, that also starts IGMP. And it's IGMP version two by default. But when I'm actually activating PIM on these interfaces here, I am in fact also activating IGMP. I'm doing that on every single LAN interface anyway, but specifically that's this is where they would make any sense because this is where the receivers would actually join those groups. So that's fairly important to know there. And right now, none of the uh, receivers have actually joined any of the groups. So none of the receivers have joined any of the groups. Uh, let's go ahead and we can verify that on R5 and R6. So we'll say run show IGMP group. And as you can see, it's the typical uh, main group. So two for uh, all routers, five for OSPF, uh, six also for OSPF 13 for PIM, 22 for IGMP version three, but there are no other groups here. What about R6? same exact group. So you've joined some well-known groups, but there are no other groups that are being signaled from the receivers down here. So nothing being signaled from REC 100 or REC 200. So right now there are no receivers in the topology. There is a source in the topology, but the source is not really sending anything. Let's go ahead and first verify all of the PIM neighborships. So we'll say, and actually there's some problem here. I'm just gonna say control C. It wasn't ready for that. So let's go to the top of the hierarchy first on all of these routers. And we'll say run show PIM neighbor. And R1 is neighbors with R2. R2, oh well. So we'll say top again, run show PIM neighbor. R2 is neighbors with R1, R3, and R7. R3, run show PIM neighbor with three and four, I'm sorry, with two, router two and router four. So you can see all of these routers are adjacent. That command has actually gotten every single one of those devices stuck. Uh, out here on four, four has the most relationships, right? So if you look at your topology, four should be adjacent to four different routers. So it is adjacent to router three, router five, router six, and router seven. So all of those neighborships are now up, which also verifies the other side. So we are good to go right now in dense mode. And how would you tell dense mode? So the neighborships don't really tell you about dense mode. So we'll say run show BIM interface. And that will, Actually, it's not this command. Which command is it? Is it detail? Run show them interfaces. There was a command here. Oh, th there's the mode. So it is working in dense mode. I wasn't just looking at it. So it is working in dense mode and that is what tells you that everything is in dense mode right now. So now that we have verified that all of the interfaces are number one in dense mode, and number two, all of the interfaces are, or all of the routers are PIM dense mode neighbors, it is actually time to send one of those very first pings, see what actually happens. So before I do that, I'm actually going to start a packet capture. And this is basically capturing all of the packets in this entire topology. And once we start this packet capture, then we will send some pings. So here we go. On the source, all I'm going to send is a single ping. So I'll say ping 172. Well, not that, that's IP, IP unicast. So 239.1.1.1. So just a simple packet 
that is being sent out here. And what should happen? So let's, before we take a look at this, and again, I hope you've listened to the caveat that I went over at the start of the lecture, but let's quickly take a look at what we think should happen here, right? So once again, this, is, this has to do with source signaling. And the source sends a multicast packet. So the source is sending a multicast packet here. What R1 should do is to flood this packet. So flood this packet to R2. R2 should be flooding this packet to its neighbors. R7 should flood this packet further out. So should R3. R4 will flood this packet back to R3. R4 will also flood this packet to R5 and R6. They should be flooding this packet on the LAN. And ultimately, the packet just kind of goes everywhere. Now, some of the main points here. We definitely expect some fireworks here between R3 and R4. So these, this is a LAN interface, so we hopefully see some assert. We should also see a couple of prunes go out. Down here, there should be some other things happening as well. There may be an assert, there may be a prune happening, or there should be an assert, there should be a prune happening here. And ultimately, once everybody realizes that there are no interfaces that have, or there are no receivers that have subscribed to the, these groups, then we should start a process of sending prunes back up. So all over the topology, the interfaces that haven't been pruned we should be sending some prunes back, uh, not over there, but all the way up to R1, and then everybody should start a prune timer, and everything should be in prune. So we have the packet capture running, and let's go ahead and see the effect of this single packet on a dense mode Junos network. So first of all, you can see how the packet was flooded throughout the domain. So if you pay attention to the VLAN out here, that's, that's the very first VLAN between router one and router uh, between the router and the source. Then on to VLAN 12, between router one and two, two floods it to three and to seven, three floods it to four, four, four floods it back to, or is it going from four to seven? I cannot tell really that one, but 47. So there is, there is a copy of the packet on every single one of the VLANs, down to 45 and 46, and all the way down to 56. Now, as this happens, you can actually see there are some joins and prunes and a search also happening. So all of this is happening in the background as the packet is being flooded. So let's go ahead and take a look. The very first thing, this is now between router three and router four. So remember three and four are going to end up sending each other a packet. And let's take a look at that. So once the packet was flooded from R1, R2 sent a packet to R3. R2 sent a packet to R7. R3 sent that packet to, down to R4. Let's stop there. But R7 also sent a copy of that packet to R4, which R4 is going to send back to R3. So on VLAN 34, we should see two copies of it. And if you look at both of those copies, they would both experience RPA failures on R3 and R4 because R3's path to get back to the source is here. And our force path to get back to the source is actually load balance between R3 and R7, but remember that highest IP. So by default, if I'm not using PIM multipathing, which I'm not, the RPF neighbor is actually R7. So our force path is back this way. So both of those packets will produce an RPF failure and they should produce a prune, but they should also produce an assert. And let's go ahead and take a look at this. So on R4, let's take a look at run show pim RPF or run show pim multicast RPF. Multicast RPF for 172 26 1.10. And as you can see, the Interface is 47 and the neighbor is 47.7 and that's because of the highest IP. So the highest next hop IP is what wins the RPF interface. But on the packet capture, you immediately see that three sent a prune to four. So this is originating from the source IP of three 
and it is being sent out on the PIM well-known multicast, but both of these packets are on VLAN 34. So they are being sent between router three and router four. Four sends a similar packet and should be sending it back to R3. But like I said, there are some enhancements built into Juno. So I'll actually have to look at these packets themselves to make some determinations about them. So let's look at the first packet. This packet is coming from R3. And what I'm going to go off of is what R3 thinks the upstream neighbor is. So in this particular case, R3 is identifying itself as the upstream neighbor. And what is R4 identifying? R4 is identifying itself as the upstream neighbor. So this is basically a self-produced packet in response to a in response to an RPF failure. That is what this upstream interface should tell you. So just a packet that is produced from R3 and R4, a prune packet. So in, if you're coming from iOS, you may expect an assert first, but in Junos, there is a prune first. Prune itself, or prune that interface first, stop the flooding, and then we'll go into the assertion. Now, down here, the same thing happens between 56 and 55. So on your topology, if you're looking at <clears throat> R6 and R5, you also see that they would also receive packets from each other on non-RPF interfaces and they are doing the same thing here. So moving on, here is the actual assert. So now in iOS, if you remember, you just send each other an assert message, you determine who is going to be the winner. If you need details about the assertion process, Please look at the iOS video, but essentially they're trying to find out who is going to be the designated forwarder on this particular topology. So I'm skipping that part of it because it was covered in the iOS video to go over this part. If you look at the asserts, so if I just look at the PIM asserts here in this topology, You can see in this timestamp, in the timestamp of 31. So all of these packets so from 120 all the way down to 131. You can see if I look at R4 and R3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There are five separate assert messages. And again, this is my interpretation of it. And I'll show it again on R5 and R6, but let's just look at R. Let's just look at R2 and R3. I'm sorry, R3 and R4. And again, this is what I think is happening. Now remember, who is going to win this assert? If you look at your topology, R3 should really win this assert because it should have a metric that is smaller. It's only a two hop metric, whereas R4 has a three hop metric to get back. So R3 and R4 both send an assert message. So here's R3's assert message. Here is R4's assert message. And they send these twice. So in that, I pretty much saw that this was unsolicited. Just to make sure that the communication is reliable, they'll both send two copies of it. And then finally, who is the assert winner here? R3 is the assert winner. R3 sends that final packet. And I think that is to make sure that everybody on that multi-axis interface knows who was the assert winner. So the final router to send the assert should actually be the assert winner. And in this case, let's go ahead and quickly compare. Let's go ahead and quickly compare R3's and R4's packets. And we will see actually that R3 should be the assert winner. So R3 and R4 are right here. So if you look at R4's metric, it's four. R3's metric is three. So R3 has the lower metric. They both have the same metric preference, which is 10. So R3 should be winning this. And that's why R3 sends that final message. Now, when it comes to R5 and R6, it's a little bit different. So R5 and R6 are going to do the same thing, but R5 and R6 are tied in the metric preference. So they both have a metric preference of 10 and they both should have an equal metric and I don't really want to calculate this right now so let's go ahead and take a look at what that metric is. They both have a metric of 5. So this is R6, this is R5. They both have a metric of 5. 
So essentially when it comes to metric preference and the metric itself, they are tied. So you're going to go by the highest IP, which is going to be R6. So R6 should be the assert winner here. So R6 should be the assert winner here. So now what I should see if my previous hypothesis is correct, R6 sends a packet to R5. In fact, it sends two just to make sure it's reliable. R5 responds with two of its own. They both determine who won. They compare the assert messages and they both come to the conclusion that R6 won. And R6 then sends that final assert message. So let's go ahead and take a look if that is what is happening in this topology. And here is a message from R6, so that's number one. R5's first message, so that's number one for R5. R6's second message, that's number two for six. That's number two for five. And finally, the number three packet from R6 to essentially tell the multi-axis interface that it is the winner of that assert. Well, that is what I think is happening. Again, if there are any comments throughout this video, I would love to hear back from you. But I wasn't able to find any documentation and this is really what I think is happening here. So in the assert. But that tells us something about our topology now, right? So that tells us something about our topology that it is now, well, I'll have to because everything while I was talking has expired. So let's send one more um, packet from the source and let's start this whole sequence again. So on the, let's start this whole sequence again and I would have to again put the right filter here to catch all of that. And this is the filter. And now if you're wondering about this filter, it essentially catches ICMP and PIM, but not the hellos because the hellos really just pollute my output. So let's go ahead and find out where that first ICMP goes through. So here's that first ICMP making its way through. It's the same packet that I'm capturing on separate interfaces. So it makes its way all the way out to 56. You see the join prunes again. You see the assert process again, and then you see the join prunes on R5 and R6. So right now, what should have happened here is that R3 and R4, because of the RPF failure, R3 and R4 should have put their interfaces in prune. The interfaces facing each other. R5 should have also put its inter interface in prune. And ultimately, R6 is the assert winner and that is what it should show. But we won't, this is such a transitional stage that we won't be able to catch this on the verification commands. Well, what happens next? R6 now as the assert winner is going to look for any recipients for 239.111. Well, it won't see any because right now, if I look at my topology on R6, show or run show IGMP groups, and I don't have that group. So now it would start a process of pruning. So let's take a look at where that process happens. So this is that process happening now. Number one, R5 is going to prune itself. So the first thing, R5 actually loses the assertion. So it has no reason. It only had one interface. It lost the assert on it. So it should really be sending a prune. And it should really be sending a prune to R4. And R4 should now respond, right? So it has to respond some way. Right now, it has just received this one prune. So let's take a look at what R4 does. R4, now this is something you don't see in the Cisco world. Let's take a deeper look at what is R5 sending R4. So this is R5's packet to R4. That's very important. And it has an upstream neighbor that is the RPF neighbor. So if you look at this, or if you pay attention to this particular field, this particular field always identifies the RPF neighbor. So this is the RPF neighbor, and this is R4. And that is fine because R5's RPF neighbor is R4. Well, what about the next packet? So immediately after that prune message went up,
I see a prune message coming from R4, but it's on the same VLAN. So in, for, all, for all intents and purposes, it is going back to R5. And the RPF neighbor is exactly the same. So what I realized is that these two packets, these two packets here are the exact same packet. So R4 is reflecting that packet to R5. So to see it on the topology, if that was the blue arrow there was R5's packet, then R4 immediately turns around and reflects that packet back to R5. And this is what I think is part of a reliable prune. So this essentially makes that whole process more reliable. Once again, this is my take on it. And the reason I say that these packets are identical is worth going over one more time. The reason I say these packets are identical is because of this upstream neighbor field. So upstream neighbor field, and look at that checksum. That checksum is exactly the same. So it's beyond the, uh, beyond the internet protocol or the IP header. At layer four, it is exactly the same packet. And I've compared them often enough and I'll share out these captures so you could go over them as well but they are exactly the same packet, which leads me to think that this is just a reliable process. So hopefully I've gone over that enough and we can move forward through the process. So right now, R4 and R5 have pruned each other off from that interface. Well, there's more assertion there. And finally, now there, is, there are some prunes that are coming from R3 to R2. So this is a prune from R3 to R2. And why is that happening? So R3 received a, so R3 is an assert winner, remember? Between R3 and R4 on this VLAN 34, R3 won the assert. But once it won the assert, what does it do next? It looks for any IGMP joints, which it doesn't find any. So that means this interface here is going to be pruned. And if you prune this interface, your only interface, multicast interface, you will be sending a prune back to R2. And if from what we have seen is correct, R2 should send a copy back off that prune to R3. So let's go ahead and see if that is happening. R3 sends a prune. Look at the upstream interface, look at the checksum, both of those things, and R2 copies the same packet or reflects the same packet back down to R3. So that is what has really happened there. Now there are some more prunes that are happening here as well. So there was a loss of assert that caused R5 to send a prune uh, to R4, but ultimately, so ultimately it also realizes that it doesn't have any IGMP joins. So it is sending one more prune. Now I'm not 100% sure what about what this prune is all about, but it is being sent on interface 45. Uh, something internally is triggering this prune. So this was the one I, I really couldn't explain why this is happening. But now if you look at it, 46 is, or R6 is the assert winner here, right? So for R6 also won the assertion. And once it won the assert, now it's going to look for any IGMP joins. And when it doesn't find any, it is going to send a prune up to R4. And R4 should respond to that prune. So that is what we should find next here. So R6 sending a prune to R4. R4 reflecting that prune back to R6. Now finally, what has happened to R4? R4 now has both of or all of its interfaces in prune, right? So they lost the assert on the 34 VLAN and it has pruned itself off here and here. That means there are no more interfaces that it needs to forward out of. That means it can now send a prune. So it should send a prune to R7 and R7 should respond to that prune. So let's go ahead and take a look at that particular part of it. So R4 sends a prune to R7. This is on VLAN 47, right there. 
and R7 reflects that pruned back. Now, I'm not going to show the rest of the process, but R7 is now completely pruned. It's going to send a prune to R2. R2 is going to reflect the prune back. That means R2 is completely pruned. R2 is going to send a prune to R1. R1 is going to prune back. And that actually is the end of the cycle. So if you look at the timestamps, the next process in PIM happens way, way late. So right now, the first part of the process takes these many messages to finish. So join prunes, join prunes, a lot of assertion, and then a final join prune to finish that process. And the finished topology is going to look something like this. So once all of that prune process happens, everything in this topology, Topology should actually be pruned. So this should be pruned here, that should be pruned, pruning here, pruning over there, uh, and this should finally be pruned. So everything in this topology right now is in prune state because there are no receivers. Well, if there are no receivers, the next question is going to be the very next message that you see here, which is a graft message. So this, again, threw me for a loop right at the start. But to look at this, we'll actually have to send another timer, uh, I'm sorry, another ICMP message out and then start looking at the process again. So I will be sending another ICMP message out and then we'll look at how this graft actually happens or why this graft actually happens. So here we are at the source. And here is one more ping. So this ping goes out and we should see the whole process once again in Wireshark. So the, the, this is a brand new capture and I'm capturing all of the packets. And here we go. Packet floods throughout the domain, join prune and the asserts. So all of that has happened now. Now, in a while we'll see those graph messages, but while we are waiting for those, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the important commands here. There are two variations of show IPM route. So there are two commands that have all of the information that show IPM route has in iOS. So the first one here is show run show pim join. Now I don't like the brief view of this. It doesn't really give me any information. It just tells me uh, the flag and the upstream interface and that's not really enough for me to determine anything. So. The variation of this command that I like is I like to qualify it with extensive. So show pim join extensive will actually see show you a lot more. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. There is a group 239.111. This is an S comma G group. So in essentially, if you put this information together, then you get your S comma G. So this is the S comma G. Then you have the IIF, and then you have the upstream neighbor. So this is the RPF neighbor in Cisco parlance or the RFC parlance. And here is your oil. So there is the outgoing interface list. Now there are two separate prune timeouts, and that actually is going to lead to the creation of the graph messages. But for right now, remember that there is assertion that happened here. So there was an assert message that happened here. So this prune timeout is actually working off of the assertion timeout. So the assertion timeout is lower by default than the, uh, the actual prune timeout, which is five minutes. So once you put an interface in prune, you stay there for five minutes, but because it was because of assertion, this timer is actually lower. So I don't remember the actual value of it. I believe it was 180, but I could be wrong about that. But what matters is it's less than five minutes. So it is definitely less than five minutes. And that's why you see this disparity here. Let's take a look at the upstream neighbor, which is 46.4. So let's look at 46, which is R4. And we'll say run show pim join extensive and you can see there is an upstream interface so this is the iif that's the rpf neighbor it is in prune right now so you sent a prune upstream for this interface and you've put it in a timeout and the downstream interfaces are going to be they're going to be a little bit different so once you receive a prune from the downstream interface 
It really is going to depend on what caused that prune. So if you look on VLAN 34, this prune was caused due to assertion. So R4 lost the assert process here, and this prune is an assert. The other two, you actually receive prunes from downstream neighbors. You receive one from R5, and you received another one from R6. So these two timers actually match that timer, but the assert timer does not. So that, again, is one thing to keep in mind here. Now, going up to R3, we'll do the same command. Run show pim join extensive. And as you can see, R3 is completely pruned right now, is it? Because I can see in the background that process happened, so that's why I want to make sure. But there is an upstream neighbor. There was a prune sent up there and the downstream neighbor is completely prune. So there was a prune that you received from four and that's that uh, the assertion winner and ultimately there was a prune. And then you send that prune over to R2. Let's look at R2. Run show pim join extensive. And again, all of the interfaces are pruned and the timers match because you received actual prunes. And finally, R1 itself should be in prune run show pim join extensive and the upstream interface itself is a directly connected interface so you're still listening for the packets on it but the entire oil is completely pruned and it is in a timeout of 217 so the graph messages there they are the first graph message that you see is actually from uh r4 to r or i'm sorry r6 to r4 and there's a graph tag. There's another graph. So obviously if R6 is sending a graph, R4 is going to graft itself back. So that is the rest of this process. But the thing to find out, the two interesting ones is why is R6 trying to graft back to the tree? And why is R3 trying to graft back to the tree? Because if you look at the two processes, there are some, there is an initial event so in this case, this is the initial event, R6 sending a graft to R4, and then everything else is a reaction. So R4 sending a graft back and R4 grafting itself back, and all of these other graphs are just reactions. So there was an initial event that we need to find out what that was, but everything else is really just a reaction. So there is another initial event here, which is R3's graft. And R3 grafted back to R2. Now remember, because of R6's graft, R2 had already grafted itself back, so R2 doesn't really respond here. But this is another initial event. So there are two initial events here, which is this initial event, and then R2 kind of responds to that event. So again, I was trying to find out what this was and why this actually happened. And the reason for this is, at least for me, it's this. With the assert, the two timers now drastically change. So if you pruned an interface because you received a downstream prune, you would prune that for five minutes. So this counter right now is timing down for five minutes. But if you did it because of assertion, you would actually prune it for a lot less. So what would happen in the topology really is that you have two different timers now running. You have a timer that is run by R4 for a prune. Say that is five minutes. So it's counting down for five minutes. And you run an assert timeout, which is I think on the scale of about three minutes. So three minutes later, this assertion goes away, right? So this interface is not pruned anymore. And what it's going to do, it's going to move from prune to forwarding. And once it moves from prune to forwarding, R6 is also going to move this interface from prune to forwarding. Now with iOS, you essentially move yourself to forwarding and you expect traffic to start flowing back because everything is synchronized. In Junos, you don't take that risk. So Junos, like I said, the implementation seemed more reliable. Junos, because the interface is now not pruned, it's forward. 
Junos actually reacts by sending a graft message. And that's what's happened, really. This assertion timer went out. The interface changed from prune to forward. That led to the upstream interface changing from prune to forward. That left to the graft. And now that led to the graph message going all over the place. Again, that's my interpretation of it. But if you look at it, it, it pretty much makes sense because who is creating these initial graphs? It's R6, which was an assert winner, and R3, which was also an assert winner. And once that happens, they again realize, so they do move into forward, but then they realize they don't really have any so from here, they go from prune to forward only to realize that there are no IGMP receivers here. So they move back into prune and then start the prune process again. So that graft is pretty much immediately followed by prunes. So these are just basically reassert messages. R3 is just telling everybody on that segment that I still exist and keep on backing off. Do not, I'm still uh, the active designated forwarder here and so does R6. But if you look at everybody else, R6 and R3 also send those prunes up. And once they send those prunes up, those prunes are going all the way back up. So once again, everybody prunes itself back on. And uh, finally, the process happens one more time. And this time it's happening for R4 and R7. So these crafts, from what I found out, they are not really any extra receiver joining. They are really just interfaces that went from prune to forward. And that led to the upstream interface going from prune to forward. And instead of just relying on the upstream neighbor to bring this into its interface into forward, you're essentially crafting yourself back onto the tree. But once again, if anybody has any information on it, please feel free to share it. So we're going to do one last thing here. By now, everybody should have timed out their multicast routing tables. So run, show, pim, join, extensive. And right now that five minute timer has passed, so everybody has expunged their tables. Now let's send continuous pings here. So from the source, I'm going to send say 100,000 pings. So I'm consistently, uh, consistently sending ICMP packets throughout the domain. And once again, I should see all of the prunes here. So if I say run show pim, join extensive, I can see that I'm pruned throughout the topology. Pruned, 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 pruned. So everybody in the topology has pruned its interfaces. And there is one more command that I'd also like to show you right now. This would be run show multicast route extensive command. Or is it run show multicast route extensive command? And once again, you can see there is some extra information in here. Where are you getting the, that information from? So it's PIM. You were looking directly at PIM. You're looking at the upstream interface. The S comma G is right here. And the forwarding state of the S comma G is actually prone. So it doesn't show you the oil. It essentially just show you what is the forwarding state right now. So let me take a look at it again. It also shows you how much lifetime is left. So you're, uh, you're essentially counting down from, this is a little bit different than the PIM timeout. So I haven't been able to take a look at this particular timeout, but ultimately you're, you will time this out in about five minutes or so. And that is what is happening. So this, I thought that this was 60 seconds longer somehow, but again, I, I wasn't 100% sure about this particular timer. Now, the source is still not having any success because everybody has pruned their interfaces off. If you look here, the whole process happened and all of these echoes are just on VLAN 10. So they are literally all on VLAN 10, but everybody has pruned itself off. So now let's have a receiver join and let's look at those graphs, right? So on receiver 100, I'll say IP IGMP join group 239 1.1.1. .1 .1. 
one. Is that what I'm sending the pings to? 1.1.1. One one one. So this should actually lead to a join or lead to grafting. And finally, you see that 56.100 or rec100 was able to join that stream. And now it's responding to the to the actual ICMP echoes with echo replies. And we should be able to see that process here. And there we go. There is that graph. So these graphs are now actually in response to the IGMP. They're not just happening by themselves. These are actual graphs that need to happen. So they're not doing, uh, this is not an event where the prune is moving forward. This is an actual receiver joining. And that leads to the flooding of the packets throughout the domain. So now you actually see the packets that are going throughout the domain. Let's take a look at the actual path of this. So I'll go with the show IP PIM join extensor because I want to see the oils. And now the interface is not pruned. So 56 is now the assert winner. And it is, there is an upstream interface, an upstream neighbor, and they are not pruned anymore. This is R4. Let's look at R4, run show PIM join extensive. And once again, there is one interface that is in forward. It is neither pruned nor assert loss, so it is in forward. That means the upstream interface is also open, which would be R2. Run show pim join extensive. And there is one interface that is in forwarding that is going to R7, which I completely missed. So run show pim join extensive on R7 because it's in the way. As you can see, there is a downstream forwarding interface. There is an upstream forwarding interface. And finally, on R1, run show pim join extensive. It's sending all of those packets down. One more command that you may want to see here is run show multicast route extensive. And the forwarding state should now be forwarding, right? So forwarding state everywhere should be, well, not on R3, but on all of the routers other than R3 the um, and R5. Well, I keep coming into these pruned routers, but from R, R1, R2, R4, R7, and R6, they should all be forwarding. And this keeps getting updated as long as you keep receiving packets on it. So like I said, it's 60 seconds longer than the five minute timeout, but it's also updating as the packets are received. So I hope this has helped. Uh, I know this wasn't as efficient as maybe the iOS presentation was, but again, these were some of the things I faced. Hopefully uh, knowing these will help you troubleshoot. I'm not even sure how many people run dense mode right now, but think of this as uh, an exercise in protocol design or how to make unreliable things more reliable, maybe Juno style. Uh, the last thing you may be wondering is state refresh. Well, I actually get a free pass there. State refresh is not something that is implemented in Junos. So there you go. No state refresh in Junos, which brings us to the end of this lecture uh, or the demo. And uh, all I can say is I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you can use some of this information to, to make maybe some of your, your own analysis. And if you have something interesting, something pithy, please let me know in the comments or via, via decodingpackets.info website. But for now, so long.